Hello and welcome to this New Braunfels Bible Church Roman study. We're going verse by verse through the book of Romans and our passage today will be chapter 14 verses 13 through 23. Today's lesson is entitled Don't Trip Each Other Over Doubtful Things. If you missed the last week's lesson, you can go back and uh, watch the Don't Judge Each Other Over Doubtful Things, which covers verses 1 through 13 of the study. And we learned that when we admonish or rebuke, we do it over clear spirit, scriptural principles, not over doubtful things. This week we'll be looking forward to verses 14 through 23, where we're not to be putting a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Verse 13 is kind of the critical turning point in this passage, where it looks back at the first passage and it looks forward to the to the rest of the chapter and covers both. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. As a bit of a quick review, we looked at uh, verses 1 through 12. We looked at that this is referring to issues where Scripture is not clear, or maybe is even silent in the age of grace. Paul uses... Uh, descriptions of food and believers who were willing to eat the food and those who were not willing to eat the food. And he also uses the description of uh, certain days that people would observe and that others would not observe. And he uses this as a way of describing not just specifically about food, but about things that are doubtful, not clear in Scripture, or maybe even the Scripture is silent in the Age of Grace. Realize that uh, many commands... Uh, from the Torah and from the from the Jewish law were restated in the age of grace uh, for believers after Jesus and uh, for example we're told in Exodus 20 that there should be no other gods and later one of many verses on this is 1 Timothy 2 5 that says there's one God one mediator the Lord Jesus Christ um, we read that you should have no graven images in Exodus and we can read again um, again, among other verses, but in 1 John 5, 21, we read, Keep yourselves from idols. Um, however, there were many commands that were not restated in the Age of Grace. Um, examples of these would be the dietary commands, the uh, remember Peter in the dream. The Sabbath commands are not restated under grace. There's, there's no requirement to convert to Judaism. Uh, think of circumcision and and I actually recommend that you go back and read Galatians 2 verses 11 through 14 where Paul actually got very excited about the idea of protecting these new believers from having to convert to Judaism. Um, and uh, so we also talked a little bit last week about other areas of doubtful matters such as alcohol, Television and movies, uh, how you school your children, how you, what you wear, what music to listen to, whether to allow sugar. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we looked at these things as areas where some believers will feel one way and others will feel another. Some will be very strict in the area and others will say, I don't even get what the big deal is. Um, and so we looked at which believer is stronger. Now, according to the passage that we studied last week, Paul believed that the one who is more strict on these doubtful things is actually the one who is weaker in their faith. And the believer who is more free on these doubtful things is stronger in their faith. If I could keep up with the PowerPoint here, we'd have, we could follow along. There we go. The one who is more free on the doubtful things is stronger in their faith. Um, we also see that there is uh, tendencies of each that the weaker believer tends toward legalism this person may look like um, the more together Christian they can be relying on a form of law rather than on grace the weaker believer is warned not to judge the other we can offer advice but not judgment um, the stronger believer tends toward freedom. They may be stronger in their faith, but it's, 
it's also very easy to get really fed up with those who are weaker. And so the stronger believer was warned not to show contempt to the other. Basically, the idea is rejoice in your freedom, but don't despise your brother. Now, we see over and over again in this passage and in other writings of Paul that he was definitely on the side of freedom when it comes to doubtful things. If Scripture was not clear on something, if it did not call it a sin, then Paul was not willing to call it a sin. He gave a warning then for both. Judgment is coming for all believers. Now, this judgment is not a judgment of salvation. This is a judgment for believers. So this is what is known in Scripture as the Bema Seat Judgment, which is a judgment for rewards. Um, the idea being everyone is going to be judged for their actions, their works, whether they are good or bad, and they are going to be given um, rewards in heaven based on the actions that they have done. The idea was that Paul was trying to hammer across to both believers, the stronger in faith and the weaker, is stop worrying about all this stupid stuff in the lives of other believers and focus on your own spiritual health. Now, verse 13 also gives us a bit of a, a look forward at verses 14 through 23 where he says, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. We're going to look at how we shouldn't be turning these doubtful things into ways of harming our brother or sister in Christ. All right, Romans 14, beginning in verse 14. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt... You are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Now, Paul is firmly on the side of grace. He knew there was nothing intrinsically unclean about meat that was not kosher or um, sacrificed to an idol or anything like this. And it's important to know that he was not advocating placing stronger believers just giving in to those who are weaker in faith, placing themselves back under the law. Um, for reference, I'd, I'd ask you to look at Galatians 5, verse 1, where we read, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. But Paul also knew that there was nothing that could justify the destruction of a Christian brother over these things. Our grace, the freedom that we are given in Christ, doesn't give us an excuse to destroy a brother or sister in Christ. And uh, so in our live class earlier today, we looked at questions, about, uh, we talked about what are some areas that, that we think could cause a brother to stumble. And we had a discussion about um, some of the more obvious ones, things like alcohol, but there were also some that were mentioned where uh, someone mentioned a, a, a church that they had been in that had been very strict and um, thought that people should dress in a certain way and that once this, this man gained freedom in Christ and understood that God isn't standing around judging whether you're dressing perfectly, um, he felt the freedom to wear more relaxed clothing. And then he started looking on those who had been more strict in their um, clothing choices for worship. And uh, it was tempting to, to wonder whether that was something that could cause those people to stumble. And uh, um, we, so there are some areas that are going to be more um, in line with what this passage is talking about and some that are going to be uh, more interesting to try to discover whether scripture is really and truly warning us that you better not ever wear shorts around someone who thinks that you should always wear pants. So let's, let's look at some of these things as we go forward. Um, the issue now though in this passage is not our personal liberty. 
He says in the passage, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. The issue is walking in love towards the one whom Jesus loves and died for. If Jesus was willing to give up his life for the sake of that brother, I can certainly give up my doubtful things if they are causing a problem. Destroying a brother makes the, my privilege wrong. Even if I feel free to act in a certain way, destroying my brother makes that way wrong. Continuing on in verse 16, therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. We can't let our freedom be spoken of as evil. Our liberty in Jesus and our freedom from the law is a good thing. I'm going to say that again. Our liberty in Christ. Freedom from the law is a good thing. But if we use it to destroy another brother in Christ, that good thing could rightly be spoken of as evil. He says in the passage that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Legalism is so incredibly just destructive. And if we're going to place food and drink or whatever the doubtful thing is that we're talking about, if we're going to place those before God's grace, and before the righteousness and peace and the joy that we gain when, when walking by the Spirit, then we are hopelessly out of touch with God's priorities, with, with, with His heart. If, we're going, if, the, if the weaker believer who tends toward legalism says, these things are more important than this righteousness and peace and joy that we get by walking by the Spirit, out of touch. But... Conversely, the freedom that we've been given is also not the end goal of God's heart. So ask yourself, what is the end goal? We see in this passage a description of this righteousness, this peace, this joy in the Holy Spirit. And we can look all through the writings of Paul where he talks about Stop trying to follow the law to find yourself approved, but instead walk by the Spirit. But that freedom that we've been given is not the end goal. God desires our hearts. Our God is a God of relationship. We know that before time began, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, we're in relationship, and that God created mankind in order to gain relationship by choice. That man is free to reject God and he is free to choose Him. And that builds that relationship. God wants us to have fellowship with Him, and He wants us to have fellowship with other believers. And when we have fellowship with God and fellowship with other believers, God is happy. But when we are causing dissension between ourselves and other believers, the fellowship is broken. And when we have, so when, when our freedom breaks that fellowship, it pains God. Learning to walk by the Spirit allows us to serve God with a heart for His righteousness. And that's the kind of thing that's going to lead to a life that is acceptable in His sight and will be approved by men. God cares about our fellowship with Him and our fellowship with other believers. Now, a quick reminder, anytime we're talking about the judgment of God, what's acceptable to God. It's important to remember in a passage like this that he is not talking about acceptable 
for salvation. He's not talking about a judgment over who will spend eternity with him and who will not. We are talking about the Bema seat judgment, not about salvation. So this is a judgment of believers. All of those who are judged in this way are believers. And they are judged for reward and position in heaven. Pursue the higher calling of the kingdom of God. In verse 19, we read on. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It's good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Brothers and sisters, we have to pursue peace. Instead of worrying about your brother's weaker faith, pursue peace. Build them up. Showing contempt for your brother is not pursuing peace. Remember the warning to the one weaker in faith was not to be judgmental of the one who was more free. And the warning to the one who is more free was not to tear down, show contempt for the one who chooses to be held to these standards. Don't tear down God's work over these issues. Paul knows there's nothing impure in this food. He says in this passage, all things indeed are clean. But he also insists that there's, there's nothing pure in causing a brother to stumble. It's important that we say very clearly in this uh, lesson that Paul's not talking about catering to legalism. He's speaking about the stumblings of a brother. He's talking about the sincere belief that this is a right or a wrong. We, it's so easy for us to, to look on the, the convictions of another and think their convictions are worthless and mine are valuable. Or uh, mine are the way that everyone should act. And you have to remember that where scripture is silent, um, the Holy Spirit can act and give conviction. And uh, it's important to know that this is not talking about the legalism of placing yourself under the law. Um, it's not catering to the whims of a legalistic believer. Remember, we must never use, place ourselves back under the law. Instead, we're going to use our liberty to build each other up, not tear each other down. Um, these are the things that make for peace in the building up of one another. In verse 22, we read on, The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Do you have a strong faith? Do you feel the liberty to partake? Whether it's this, uh, the, the meat that they're talking about in this passage, or whether it's some other area, uh, whether you feel more free to have a glass of wine with your dinner, or whether you feel free to, um, uh, as, a, as a woman, you feel free to wear pants, whereas in some cultures they would, and some churches would frown on that. Whatever the area is where these doubtful um, actions and these doubtful issues occur, if you feel more free Praise God. But have your strong faith before God, not before a brother or a sister who will stumble. So this is an interesting area because it's easy for us to go to take this to, if you try to take this to a conclusion that anytime a person around you feels more strongly about an area, 
then you should just do what they, how they feel. If someone says that uh, all women should always wear long dresses and keep their hair covered, and well, that's a doubtful thing, uh, not stated under grace. But uh, if I don't feel that way, does that mean that I now have to ask my wife and daughters to cover their hair and wear long dresses at all times? No. Um, and it's important to know that what we're talking about is having your convictions for yourself. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Living by living by grace and walking by the Spirit leads to happiness. And the freedom and the liberty that uh, we are given in Christ gives a joy in your heart and allows for that fellowship between you and God and for between you and others. Um, and you have to remember, not every Christian knows this happiness. And the Christian who is bound up in legalism is not going to understand what we're talking about with this happiness because um, <laughs> I, I've heard the analogy used uh, that someone is a lemon-sucking Christian that when they, they go through their their day, it just their face puckers up because they're just constantly judging and and looking on down on others, and, and it's like the, their face looks like they just sucked on a lemon. Verse 23 wraps up this passage, and it says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Remember, the Holy Spirit can convict you over a doubtful thing. Scripture can be completely silent on an area, and uh, you can feel liberty and freedom in that area. And the Holy Spirit can choose to convict you in that area, change your heart and change your mind about something. Remember, spiritual growth sometimes comes with knocking off the rough edges of your life. Maybe with a new area of responsibility, maybe with a new uh, ministry or a new, um, a new understanding of a subject or topic. Um, an example of this would be a, a new parent who can find themselves suddenly convicted about the movies that they watch. Their children come along and they see these movies through their children's eyes and, and through the innocence of their children and they don't want to harm that. So now they're convicted by the Holy Spirit of the kind of movies that they're watching. Well, this Christian was, um, if this Christian did not have that conviction before, then they were not living in sin. But when that conviction comes, it is now a sin to ignore the Holy Spirit. We can ignore the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit challenges you to give something up, you can choose to ignore Him. You can go on approving those things in your life. But I caution you against it. Uh, ignoring the Holy Spirit can lead to hardening of your heart and lead to all types of, of uh, damage in the life of the believer. Remember, the, the challenge, the, the scriptural admonition is not to just go and live your life however you want. It's to stop living by law, but walk by the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to give you conviction and teaching that will make you more like Christ. When we do the things that uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us not to do, we are we're condemning ourselves. And it may not be that the thing itself is clearly good or bad, but it's enough that God speaks to us about the matter. Paul gives a final um, test here in this verse that's a useful one. Um, he concludes with a principle that kind of can help judge gray areas. just realized I didn't move anything along on the screen, so I'll do that now. The Holy Spirit can convict. We can choose to ignore. That condemns. We condemn ourselves. So the final test that he puts here in this verse is that if you can't do it in faith, then it's sin. Whatever is not from faith is sin. This is a a good check on our tendency to justify ourselves 
in what we permit. Um, we're really good at excusing and justifying our actions, and uh, it's it's important in the life of the believer to um, to not justify actions that grieve the Father. And uh, if you're troubled by something, if the Holy Spirit's putting that trouble in your heart over a matter, then it likely isn't a thing of faith, and it likely would be a sin for you. Um, it's it's a, co- a difficult concept, and one that I'm going to ask that you spend some time this week praying about, because it is uh, important to know that you that. Paul is not asking us to go on and take on the new yoke of legalism. He's not asking us to go put ourselves back under the law. And so if you have a believer around you who feels strongly that we should um, observe the Sabbath, well, I mean, we don't. In our church, we don't observe the Sabbath, which would technically start on Friday evening and would go through Saturday evening. Um, the observation of the Sabbath was a command under the law and was not restated in grace. But if you came across a believer who felt like the only way to truly honor God was to continue to honor the Sabbath, that doesn't mean that you now have to honor the Sabbath in order to, uh, in order to cater to their, to their feelings. Um, this not causing a brother to stumble issue is a bit more complicated than that. Um, it, go, it comes with uh, discernment and wisdom. And uh, there will be times when you will be challenged because a, a believer who is weaker in their faith and stronger in their uh, list of do's and don'ts will challenge you and say that you're living in a licentious or uh, Though they may call it cheap grace and will say that the way that you're living your life is not pleasing to God. Um, and the, maybe they will say that the way that you play music in your church is not pleasing to God or the way that, uh, and, and these are, it's easy for us to say these are, these are uh, silly things because absolutely the Bible doesn't say, listen to this kind of music and not that kind of music. It, these are doubtful things, things that man has put forward as a standard in order to try to maintain a, some level of, of holiness. Well, the Bible describes that as being the one weaker in faith. Um, so you're going to be challenged on how to respond in those situations. Does it mean that you, that you give in and only that you remove all musical instruments from your church because some churches don't believe that you should have any musical instruments? Does it mean that you should, uh, like I said earlier, require your wife and children to only wear long skirts and cover their hair? Does it mean that you should say that you will never touch another drop of, of wine? I'm not here to say the answer to all of these things. But I am going to say that you'd better have a conversation with God about your convictions. If you have a feeling in some way, uh, an example would be, uh, we're all sitting around and we're having ham sandwiches. And someone comes along who believes that they are more honoring to God and that they are convicted that we should just never have ham, that that analogy for Peter was only about the Jews and Gentiles and has nothing to do with actual dietary restrictions. And they come along and they are offended that I am now eating a ham sandwich. Um, Maybe in the moment, the discerning thing to do would be to not defend my rights. Maybe place that ham sandwich aside. And then when you are no longer in the heat of the moment, when you are, when everyone is calmer, Maybe then it's time to have a further conversation with that believer and discuss the freedom in Christ, the grace that is offered, the fulfillment of the law that Jesus brought. Paul clearly says that the one who is not held to these extra standards is the one stronger in faith. 
But he also then warns us, don't be dismissive of the one who is weaker in faith and don't put a stumbling block in front of them. If your brother or sister has had struggles with alcohol and has, um, has conviction in their life that this is a sin for them, then if they were to see a brother who is free in this area and who has a glass of wine with their dinner, that can cause the one who struggles with this uh, alcoholism to stumble and to fall into what would be clearly sin. God doesn't work in, in these human ways where there's always a set standard that everyone must follow. He gives us his grace, his freedom, and it's a beautiful thing. But we are given responsibility. Um, so use discernment and reach out to your brother or sister in love, remembering the love that Jesus had for them, building each other up and not tearing each other down. It's important to ask God to clearly show you the convictions that you have or maybe the new convictions that he wants to put in your heart, the rough edges that he wants to polish off. Maybe he wants to show you a new passage of scripture that will, that will uh, help make you more Christ-like. Stop living by the law and walk by the Spirit. And he gives righteousness and peace and joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would work through the teaching of your word. I pray that any of my words that were added to yours uh, that stray from your intention would be forgotten. And any words that reflect your love and your intention and your desire for us as believers would resonate in the hearts of every listener. And I pray, Lord, that if someone is uh, listening and does not understand what this grace is all about, uh, I pray that you would give them uh, an opportunity to, to learn more and to become more free. And I pray that those who are understanding and free would learn to act in love and wisdom and discernment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Next week we'll begin in Romans 15. See you then.